tactical consideration is an evidence-based concept for the fire service to consider implementing to enhance efficiency and effectiveness. Tactical considerations are meant to inform, not replace, local standard operating procedures. It is important to recognize that each situation is unique, requiring different tactical choices to achieve the incident priorities. Click to hear how some of the technical panel members are using the information garnered from tactical considerations to inform policy development and on-scene decision making. A tactical consideration to me is, uh, is just that. It's a consideration. It's something that gives that department, gives you the ability to evaluate as a tool to utilize on the fire ground. It may be not for every single fire, it may be not for every single uh, department, but it gives you another tool in your toolbox to utilize based on your staffing, based on your response matrix, based on the, the structure that you respond to. So really taking the research and looking at the results and then taking your experiences back and understanding that the tactical considerations that come out of the research can really help you change your perspective or change your mind in how you're actually operating on the fire ground and make things better for your crew, your department, or the people that we serve. Once tactical considerations or the study's complete and we, we evaluate those tactical considerations, we take a little bit of time and kind of chew on it and really look at how it's going to affect the fire ground for the Los Angeles County Fire Department. Um, is it a beneficial tool? Is it anything that we really need to change? Or do we really just need to get out to the field information to reinforce and validate why we do certain things? There's a lot of things on the fire ground in LA County Fire Department that we do that have been based on the same research for the last 10 years. So it's kind of just updating at this point uh, some additional tweaks or additional information that we have that can validate our firefighters' experiences on the fire ground and really educate our recruits to an even higher level of education in fire dynamics, fire behavior, um, and tactics on the fire ground. Things that you should know if you want to be a critical thinking, effective firefighter. These tactical considerations are a culmination of the efforts with the FSRI staff taking their data and their research and combining it with the technical panel's experiential knowledge to really formulate best practices and the gold standard for achieving the best benefits for the fire service and for potential fire victims on the fire ground. So as you watch the videos from these experiments, and I hope you do, regardless of your rank, I think you're gonna see this from a little bit of a different perspective. From the fire ground, your focus is on the tasks and, and accomplishing the, the fire ground objectives. During the experiments, as I sat next to the trailer, you really kind of have a, a, another layer between you and, and the action, and it really allows you to see the, the entire fire ground for what it is. You start to understand how our tactics are affecting not just our immediate area, but they're affecting all the areas around that, that structure or in that fire ground. But what this research really uh, allows us to find out is how does it affect the fire ground globally? How does it affect it at that 60 or, or 100 feet level where the remote rooms are involved or perhaps the second story that we're not up to yet? What's happening in those spaces and how are our tactics affecting the survivability of potential victims in those areas? For me, it was really exciting because it, it really started to identify which tactics were effective and, and really going to shape the way that we make evidence-based tactical decisions on the fire round. Well, FSRI provides a list of tactical considerations. To me, tactical considerations is a framework for decision making. It provides you with some you know, foundational knowledge and some uh, guidelines for, uh, to provide you with some, some generic insight as to a particular operation or uh, how the fire is going to behave in a certain set of parameters. So this allows us to you know, expedite our, our decision making because if we can more readily make these patterns and draw these conclusions and anticipate how the fire is going to react, we can better select um, the tactics that are yield, going to yield the best possible outcome. So in turn, uh, ULFSRI conducted the studies for the coordinated fire attack 
in acquired structures. So these were actual legacy era uh, buildings set up for these experiments with actual furnishings. So these are actual buildings with actual fuel loads. These are real fires and they're going to react accordingly. The content presented in this module can be divided into two distinct sections. In the first section, we will revisit tactical considerations that were developed from previous research experiments conducted in lab-based structures and evaluate how they hold up in acquired structures under less controlled conditions. In the second section, we will focus on some new tactical considerations developed based on the results of this research. Click the icons to begin. As previously mentioned, this research into coordinated fire attack in single-family dwellings builds upon previous FSRI-led studies into standalone ventilation and suppression tactics on the fire ground. Many of these previous studies were conducted in purpose-built one- and two-story structures that resembled single-family homes. In addition, the experiments were conducted in a laboratory setting, under controlled conditions in hardened structures designed to withstand multiple burns without losing structural integrity. Among the goals of these experiments was to determine if these previously published tactical considerations translated from purpose-built lab structures to acquired structures in the field. In this section, we will recall some of the previous tactical considerations and discuss their relevance to the current experiments. Use this menu to navigate the content in this section. Tactical considerations developed from prior experiments stress that applying water in the most efficient manner results in decreased temperatures, heat release rates, and fire gas production. Specifically, laboratory experiments were conducted as part of the study of the impact of fire attack utilizing interior and exterior streams on firefighter safety and occupant survival. They showed that achieving proper mapping or water distribution within the structure is the quickest means to improving conditions in the structure. In many cases, post-flashover fires in these lab-based structures were extinguished with comparably small total amounts of water, even when the suppression crew used a flow-and-move approach. Acquired structure experiments in single-family dwellings conducted as part of this study confirm this conclusion. Let's take a closer look. As you can see here, all the laboratory experiments conducted as part of the original fire attack study used less than 250 gallons of water in the suppression efforts, not including the water required for final mop-up in the fire room. The experiments conducted in this project had comparable total water flows to similar experiments conducted in the laboratory. Here you can see the water used for fire control and the total water usage for the 20 acquired structure experiments. The darker shaded regions located on the bottom of the individual bars represent the total amount of water used for the initial knockdown. The lighter shaded regions located on the top of the individual bars represent the additional water utilized during overhaul efforts. Like in the laboratory experiments, all experiments use less than 250 gallons of water for fire control. Further, total water usage, including water used for overhaul and extension, was less than 500 gallons. Click the icon to view more details from the experiments or click next to continue. Here you can see the average water usage by suppression method. Out of the 20 experiments, the two which used the most water were the two failed sealing exterior suppressions in method four. This is consistent with expectations since these experiments involved two exterior suppression actions followed by interior extinguishment. The experiments which used the least amount of water were those in method six. The water usage among the experiments in methods one, two, and three varied from 88 to 181 gallons. The differences in structure layout were partially responsible for some of the differences in cumulative flow between experiments. Experiment 16 had the highest water usage of the 12 interior suppression experiments. In this experiment, 
the suppression crew adopted a flow and move technique during the advance to the kitchen fire. During suppression, there is an approximately 25 second period in which the nozzle firefighter was directing the stream at a wall outside the kitchen, resulting in a period where suppression was ineffective at reducing kitchen temperatures. This explains why this experiment had a higher cumulative water flow than comparable experiments. It also illustrates how even a flow and move suppression technique with a substantial period of ineffective suppression use less water than the 300 gallon minimum capacity for water tanks on fire apparatus. Let's hear from our technical panel. When you talk about the amount of water being utilized on a lot of these tests, 250 gallons puts out a ton of fire. But I think the biggest piece is that we have to make sure that we educate our firefighters on how to get water where it needs to go. Because if you get water where it needs to go, it doesn't take a lot of water to put that fire out. Whether it's from the interior or exterior, the goal is getting water where it needs to go quickly and you don't need a lot. And reminding our guys that you've got 500 gallons in your tank or more, let's utilize that, but we've got to continue to get that supply line to get that, that secondary water source so that we have that backup and that reinforcement. Because you can see in the, the coordinated attack study that once there's knockdown, we maybe flow two, three, four, 500 gallons of water to complete full extinguishment and overhaul. Um, but to see the numbers to be so comparable, that's a great reinforcement that whether it's in the lab or on the street, the data is the data and it's all true in there. Actual numbers, I, I knew that uh, the water usage was going to be lower than maybe I expected, but it was considerably lower than I expected. Um, and then as far as how does it translate, I think what it does for... What it does for my department is it deprioritizes that water supply. So instead of having the, the second two or the first two catch up a, a hydrant on the way in, we might have them come directly to the, the scene and, and really get inside the building, help that initial attack line get to the seat of the fire and, and start those searches faster. And maybe the third do is going to, to, to catch a water supply. Uh, and I think that it does a couple things for us. It, it gets obviously people inside the building, gets the, the initial attack line to the seat of the fire quicker, but it also gets bodies in there to look for, um, it gets firefighters in there to look for uh, potential victims, whereas before they would be outside um, trying to establish a water supply. So. really been focused on GPM and it's well yes we do want to overcome the the heat release rate of the fire with the appropriate amount of GPM the emphasis is is truly should be on the placement of that water not so much let's not keep increasing GPM numbers let's figure out how we can uh, most economically use that water so once once you've overcome that that figure it's just getting the water where it needs to go to have its intended effect. And you know, I'm proud to say that my, my department I work for, you know, we have always placed that, that high emphasis on early water application and our first do commits directly to fire attack and has for a considerable amount of time. And you know, that's because the, the longer that we wait on putting water on the fire, the, you know, the, the larger the fire is going to get and the, the more water we're going to need cumulatively. For so long, the fire service has really been focused on GPM, and it's, well, yes, we do want to.